Today's reading comes from the Gospel of Luke, chapter 16, verses 19 through 31. Listen for the word of the Lord. <clears throat> there was a rich man who was dressed in purple and fine linen and who feasted scrumptiously every day. And at his gate lay a poor man named Lazarus, covered with sores who longed to satisfy his hunger with what fell from the rich man's table. Even the dogs would come and lick his sores. The poor man died and was carried away by the angels to be with Abraham. The rich man also died and was buried. In Hades, where he was being tormented, he looked up and saw Abraham far away with Lazarus by his side. He called out, Father Abraham, have mercy on me, and send Lazarus to dip the tip of his finger in water and cool my tongue, for I am in agony in these flames. <coughs> but Abraham said, Child, remember that during your lifetime you received your good things, and Lazarus, in like manner, evil things. But now he is comforted here, and you are in agony. Besides all this, between you and us, a great chasm has been fixed, so that those who might want to pass from here to you cannot do so, and no one can cross from here, from there to us. He said, Then Father, I beg you to send him to my father's house, for I have five brothers, that he may warn them, so that they will not also come into this place of torment. Abraham replied, They have Moses and the prophets. They should listen to them. He said, No, Father Abraham, but if someone goes to them from the dead, they will repent. He said to him, If they do not listen to Moses and the prophets, neither will they be convinced, even if someone rises from the dead. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks, Thanks be to God. God. Would you all pray with me for just a moment, please? Good and gracious God, we give you thanks for this word that comes to us to remind us of how we live in you and how you are the one who calls us to help you in this world. I pray, Lord, that as we go into this time of learning, the Holy Spirit would move among us and use this story to remind us that you are calling us and transforming us each and every day. Lord, I pray that as I speak, I would only be your vessel, that your words would be heard here this day. And I pray that the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts and minds would be acceptable to you who is our rock and our redeemer. Amen. Amen. As we begin this morning, I'm going to call Bill Bishop forward to share a moment, uh, a testimony of thanksgiving for us. You want to come up here, Bill? Uh, may, may I speak from here? Sure. Okay. Sure. Extremely thankful of that, and it brings me back to uh, 2003, <coughs> how I got here, and that was actually a little bit of a troubled time, not compared, of course, to the divisions we have today. But what was troublesome to me was that the President of the United States at that time was advocating preemptive war, and I just could not reconcile the notion of preemptive war and my faith. So I went to my church at the time, which was the uh, uh, Barrington Methodist Church, with a conversation that was designed to stir up some interest and see what others felt. So I had, was all prepared and I made my presentation.
organization. And as I looked around, I realized that there wasn't one person uh, in the congregation who I was talking to who was sympathetic to my view. In other words, everybody was signed off on the idea we're going to be doing a preemptive war, and we're going to be taking care of, in this case, uh, Iraq, the way they need to be taken care of. At that point, I decided I just had to um, move churches, even after 25 years, and even after being a captain of the United States Army for some years. Um, so I shopped six different churches here in Barrington, and the only one that was really open to at least the possibility that preemptive war made no sense was St. Paul. So, joined up, stayed, and I'm very thankful I have. Thank you very much. something that Ruthie Gregory brought to me um, a few weeks ago. A few weeks ago, on the second Sunday of October, you know we talked about sharing. We called that our sharing Sunday. Sharing was the word that we decided to use this year instead of stewardship, right? <laughs> because stewardship, that word scares us all. But we all know, let me just get it out now, we all know that the church is going to have to have money to be in business in the world, right? So we decided to have a sharing Sunday. And I don't know exactly what I talked about that day, but the next day, Ruthie sent Marty over to the church with this thing that she had in her daily devotional for that Monday following the Sunday of sharing that we did here at St. Paul. And she sent it to me, she's like, I thought this was appropriate after your sermon yesterday. I wanna share that with you. I've got Ruthie's permission to share this story with you because it's something that I think reminds us that there are days when we are Lazarus lying at the gate, and there are days when we are the rich man who has no name, walking and worrying about ourselves. Let, let me read this. It's this devotional from the upper room, right, R Ruthie? Our pastor recently challenged us to discover the depths of generosity and the blessings of giving. For each of 15 days, we were given a new task designed to help us discover the gift of generosity. During this experience, I remembered that in the early years of my parents' marriage, they struggled financially due to a meager income, seminary expenses, family illness, and a broken down vehicle. At a prayer meeting, a man stood and told of a family in the community who was experiencing great difficulties and needed help. My father had only $2 to his name, but with a loving and generous heart, he contributed all of it to the needy family. The following day, he was shocked to learn that the money had been collected for us, his own family. That's a true story written by Joy <coughs> Freeman Buff of North Carolina. When I read that, when Marty brought it over to me, you know, it probably would have been logical that I would have thought of the story of the widow's mite, the one where the widow has two denarii left and she takes them and gives that all to the temple to use. And Jesus points out to those who are asking him questions, look, she has two denarii, she's given it all. That is so much more in the kingdom of God than all the wealth and the riches that those of us who have more are giving. It would be logical that I thought of that story, but I didn't think of that story because I'm not logical some days. Um, I thought of the story of Lazarus laying at the gate, and the rich man walks by him every day to go into his house and have the sumptuous feast, it says in the scripture, as the man Lazarus lays on the ground and the dogs come to lick his sores. That's the first story that came to my mind when I thought about scripture after reading this story from Ruthie's devotional. Because it struck me that some days we are the people saying, can you help us help a family? And some days we are the ones sitting in our own midst needing help 
and we don't realize that we need it, but we're still willing to give generously to help those who need. Some days we are Lazarus laying at the gate. Some days we are the rich king walking by and not paying any attention to that person lying on the ground. I've been consumed for this past couple weeks with thoughts of the Lazaruses in our world. It's very significant that Luke names Lazarus, but he does not name the one who is the rich person in the scripture. Lazarus is a form of Eleazar, and Eleazar in Hebrew means God has helped him. And so it's significant that we have the name of this one that is being helped, and we don't have the name of the one who is walking by him. Isn't it more uh, found more often in our society that we don't know the names of the ones being helped, but we know the names of the bigwigs with the money, don't we? I've been consumed with these images of who's laying at our gate, who's out there that we don't even know is at the door, wanting to get in, wanting just to have their hunger fed. That image came to me when I saw the image on the internet the other day of the little girl with her head resting on the top of her daddy's head as he carried her from Honduras to our gates. I can't get that image out of my mind of that little girl so tired, so worn out, and she goes to sleep with her head resting on the top of her father's who is carrying her mile after mile after mile to flee the violence in their country who if we know our history, we realize our kingdom was a part of creating in Honduras. I couldn't get out the image in my mind of the little boy who was lying on the beach in the water in Turkey when they were fleeing that country. I couldn't get out of my mind, and I still can't get out of my mind, the idea of people laying in front of hospital doors. Do you know 40,000 of the people laying in front of hospital doors that can't get in are United States veterans? Do you know that? That some of the people that we are walking by every day, not paying any attention to what their names are, are United States veterans. The ones who went to war in Iraq and Afghanistan and other places so that we could have the privilege of having what we have. Can't get those images of those Lazaruses laying at our gates in fact, when I was researching this sermon, do you know that I watched a video online of a veteran sitting with his sign in front of him saying, I'm a homeless vet, could you help me? And someone whose face was blacked out in the video with a security guard um, emblem on his shoulder came up to the man and said, you just need to get a job. You just need to get up off of your butt and do something in this world. You could open doors for people. <clears throat> and another man came up and said, you served our country, ha, 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 and poured his dinner on top of the veteran's head. You see, we've forgotten, I think, that there are times when we're Lazarus laying at the gate, or perhaps we're Mother Hubbard at the cupboard, and there's nothing inside of it. We've forgotten that what this story teaches us from Scripture is that there is this big, huge gulf between what we want and what reality is, and if we are not careful, that gulf is going to grow and grow and grow, and those who have nothing are going to die on the streets of the United States of America. This piece of apocalyptic literature in the time that it was written was meant to warn people that you've got to change, you've got to be different. You have to remember that Luke's gospel is all focused on the least, the last, and the lost. 
That's the focus of Luke's gospel. He puts the words into Jesus' mouth to teach us that those who have not are the people that the kingdom of God is about. The Lazaruses of this world. He tells this story of how the rich man has a reversal of fortune and he's harmed and hurting in Hades. Now, not that I think that we're uh, going to hell, but I do think that we suffer our own kind of harm and hurting when we don't reach out to one another. David Lowe's, I've qu quoted him before, he says the scripture is not about some afterlife that we're going to have to worry about. We're going to have to worry about the harm and the hurt that we have in our own lives now because we simply cannot see the Lazarus in front of us. This scripture is meant to warn us that things have to be different, that this world has to have a reversal of what's going on right now, that those who have not, that percentage is growing, and those who have, that percentage is shrinking. But those who have still have the capacity to walk by the Lazarus on the street to scream at the Lazarus at the gate, saying, you cannot come in here. You do not belong here. Those who have, have the power to ignore that war is killing our people, God's people. So this Lazarus story to me is like the story of the man who only had $2 in his pocket. He was going to give that to whatever family was worse off than his family was. Imagine, imagine if we approach Thanksgiving with not thinking about all of the great, wonderful things we have at the Thanksgiving dinner table. That big old turkey sitting there, all of the food. But we approach Thanksgiving with saying, thank you, Lord, for the tough lessons that you teach me. Thank you, Lord, for the Lazarus that I saw yesterday that reminded me of what the kingdom of God truly is. Thank you, Lord, for spurring me when I only had $2 in my pocket to give it to the man sitting on the street so that he might buy a McDonald's burger for lunch. Thank you, Lord, for those hard things that happen in our lives that teach us that the kingdom of God is supposed to be about everybody, not just a few. What if this Thanksgiving, instead of bemoaning how bad the shooter was in Thousand Oaks, California, we say a little prayer for that young man's soul, a veteran, damaged, who took an action that we find horrific, but he's still a child of God. What if this Thanksgiving, we really concentrated on the fact that we have so much to learn about what it truly means to be in the kingdom of God? I know that when I go to the city, I walk by people, I don't, I don't give them anything, because you know why? I'm always in a hurry. I'm always in a hurry. But when I think about how I walk past a human that I don't know and I'm always in a hurry, I then have to convict myself, or the Holy Spirit convicts me, that I do that to people that I love. I walk by them really fast when they need something from me. There are Lazaruses lying at the gates of our hearts that we're not even seeing. The friend who we had sharp words with. The person that we haven't called on the telephone for months on end. The parent that we haven't talked to, the sibling that we are in rivalry with, the college chum that we swore we would always be best friends with and we haven't seen them forever. There are people lying at the gates of our hearts even. And maybe that's what we have to concentrate on this Thanksgiving, is looking at those people <coughs> lying at the gates of our hearts that we are ignoring. Because if maybe we made a move forward towards those folks, it might become easier for us to move forward towards those folks sitting on the ground we don't know. I don't really know. 
I don't really know. I just know that this story of Lazarus is convicting me in a way this year that it has never done in the past. When I think about all of the people, all of the children of God that suffer every single solitary day, and I get mad if the line at Starbucks is too long. That's something that we ought to get an amen on because we all do that, don't we? We all get mad that the line at the Starbucks is too long and maybe what I have done is I have missed the person sitting outside the door at Starbucks who needs a hot chocolate or a hot cup of coffee to stay warm. I just know that somehow the Holy Spirit is convicting me that we have missed something about what it means to be the generous children of God. And I know that in this time of the year, it's so easy to be generous, but when January comes, what about January? What about February? Do you know that food pantries get a majority of food between November and December, and by February they have nothing on the shelves? It's easy to give when we feel good. Maybe what we need to remember is that we need to give even when we don't feel good. There was this quote I posted on Facebook yesterday and it talked about how the Bible story is not about intellectual assent. It's not about having a great, wonderful feeling in your heart. It's about being so convicted by the truth that you have no other choice but to act in this world. Maybe that's why this story of Lazarus is working so hard on my heart right now because I know there's so much to do. We've got so much work to do in this world. I invite you, as we go into these next 10 days before Thanksgiving, I invite you to examine how this Lazarus story is working on you. Are there people lying at the gates of your heart that you don't let in? Are there people lying on the streets that you walk past? Are there issues in this world that need the voice of the kingdom of God brought toward them? And maybe, just maybe, this year on Thanksgiving, we'll sit down to our tables and realize the privilege we have of being at that table is more and deeper than just a one-day holiday of the year. It's an everyday action for the kingdom of God in this world. Amen. Amen.